Welcome to STEAM Explore and Design Thinking. My name is Amy Drake, and I'm going to be your host for today's lesson. Today, we are going to explore the beautiful world of color. If I asked you, when was the first time you learned about color? It might be a little bit hard for you to remember because we as humans learn about color from a very early age. That's how we learn to identify the things around us. The block is red, the sky is blue, the grass is green. But have you ever really wondered what is color? Not what things are this color or what things are that color, but what is color itself? Color is light. Light is a type of energy that travels in waves. Visible light contains all the colors that we see. When a white light is shined into a prism, the prism actually bends the light so we can see the different colors. This is the same thing that happens when we see a rainbow. The water droplets in the atmosphere, they act like a prism, and that's what creates our rainbow. We're gonna watch a video to learn a little bit more about this. The same effect can be created by passing a narrow beam of white light through a glass prism. The beam is split up into a spectrum of colors, the same colors and in the same order as those in a rainbow. The prism makes the beam of light change direction. Different colored light is bent by different amounts. Violet is bent the most, while red is bent the least. White light is a mixture of many colors which the prism separates out. Let's consider why color is useful. Why are people able to see in color? Color is so important and for so much more than just making things look pretty, color actually can send messages, help us identify objects, and save lives. In which picture can you see the fruit better? Turn and talk to a partner and explain which picture you think and why you think so. One reason that people have such good color vision is that it helps us to survive. We can easily find fruit in the tree. We can see in a moment if the fruit is ripe and ready to eat or even if the fruit is spoiled and not good for us. Okay, next question. What do these colors mean? Turn and talk to a partner about what you think. You got it. All over the world, people agree that a red traffic light means stop and a green traffic light means go. Now the colors themselves don't actually say this anywhere. It's just the meaning that we've given to these colors. We agree no matter where you go, if you see red, it generally means slow down or stop, and green generally means it's safe to proceed. Go ahead and move forward. Okay, one last question for you and your partner. Take a look at this picture and explain to your partner who drives this car. You're right, a police officer drives this car. Now, even if you live in a country where the police drive a different type of car, maybe it looks a little bit different by its shape, 
you still can identify it as a police car just by the way it's painted and marked. This might be in the way the colors are used or just in the way the colors are applied to the car. So this is a very recognizable image to us as well. Here's a fun fact. Did you know that yellow is the first color that your eye sees? That's why yellow is used in so many warning signs and emergency vehicles. Let's go ahead and take a look at a few. Now that we've learned a little bit about color, let's start exploring with color. When artists explore with color, they often mix their paints to get just the right color for the picture that they're painting. Did you know that just by mixing two or three colors, you can achieve all the colors of the rainbow? Give me or your teacher a thumbs up if you've ever done this before. If you haven't, don't worry. We're gonna give you an opportunity to try mixing colors. I'm going to ask you a question and I want you to make a prediction. What do you think will happen if you mix blue paint with yellow paint? Think about that for a minute. Blue paint and yellow paint. Did you predict that you would end up with green paint? Well, if you did, you're correct. Let's do another one. What happens if you mix red paint with blue paint? Red paint and blue paint. Hmm. How about purple? Did you predict purple? You would get purple paint if you mixed red and blue. Okay, one more. How about this? What if you took equal parts of yellow paint, red paint, and blue paint? Let's try to predict. That one's a little harder to imagine. If you mix those three paint colors in equal parts, you'd end up with brown. I have a fun challenge for you. As you're exploring with color today, you are going to discover how colors can be mixed or appear to be mixed by adding motion. For this challenge, you will use a fidget spinner, a white cardboard circle, and two colored markers. The markers should either be red, yellow, or blue. You will take your white cardboard circle and color the top of it with alternating colors just like the slices of a pizza. Then you'll mount it to the top of your fidget spinner and spin it really fast. Observe what happens, record what you see. Then share your spinner with a friend, show them what you discovered and learn what they discovered. When you spin a fidget spinner with two colors on it, it's moving so quickly, you can't see those two colors separately they actually merge to make one color. So you are able to see either orange or green or purple. Amazing. Congratulations for completing section one of this lesson, exploring with color and color illusions. Now it's time to move on to section two, where you will step into the role of design engineer and you will help design creative solutions for the problems around you. I want to tell you a little bit about the Western Snowy Plover. It's a beautiful bird that has lived along the California coast for thousands of years. Unfortunately, only 2,500 of these birds remain, and that's primarily because their habitat has been destroyed or at least damaged a lot by humans. We're gonna watch a little video that will help us understand the Western Snowy Plover a little bit and empathize with their needs. Hi there, my name is Sarah and I work for California State Parks. Today I'm here at the Oceano Dunes District and I'm here with my friend Poppy the Plover. Poppy is a western snowy plover and today I'm going to ask her questions like where does the western snowy plover live, how do they act, how do they behave, and what it means to be a threatened species. So Poppy, my first question for you is can you tell me a little bit about what the western snowy plover looks like? 
We have dark colored bills, a snowy white belly, gray brown coloring on our wings and on top of our head, tiny black legs, and dark brown or black spots above our forehead, near our eyes, and on our shoulders. These are all important features because they help us camouflage well and hide from predators. Even our speckled eggs blend in well. We are pretty small, never growing much bigger than six inches, and our chicks only weigh as much as one quarter when born. Poppy, can you go ahead and tell me where the western snowy plover lives? The western population of the western snowy plover can be found all the way from Washington to Baja, California. But more specifically, we are shorebirds, which means that we live on or near the beach. When nesting, we prefer the four dune habitat. Four dune habitat consists of small dunes and open space that is higher up on the shoreline in dry sand. Plovers like pieces of driftwood and other small debris around our nests. We make nests called scrapes right in the sand. These scrapes allow us to hunker down for protection from weather and other animals that might want to eat us. We forage for food near the water's edge. You can see us looking for invertebrates in the piles of seaweed that wash up on shore. These piles are called rack. Awesome, now that we know a little bit about where the western snowy plover lives and what they look like, can you tell me about how they act or how you behave? Sure, some plovers will stay here on this beach year round while others leave and then come back when it's time to breed, build their nests, lay eggs, and raise their chicks. Nests usually have one to three eggs and the eggs take about one month to hatch. Within hours of hatching, the baby chicks are out and looking for their own food, a yummy snack of small insects or crustaceans. Nesting season here is March through September, arguably the most important season for western snowy plover protection. But Poppy, why is it so important to protect the western snowy plover? Because the western snowy plover is listed under the Federal Endangered Species Act as a threatened species. This is a law that was set in place to protect species of animals that are becoming less and less in number. When a species is threatened, it means that the animal is likely to become endangered in the future if people don't act quickly to help protect it. But what does endangered mean? To be endangered means to be at risk of becoming extinct. But what does extinct mean? Extinct is a word used when an animal species no longer exists. So if the number of western snowy plovers does not increase over time, we could eventually become endangered or even extinct. Wow, thank you for explaining that to us, Poppy. But now I want to know how my friends and I can best protect the western snowy plover when we're having fun at the beach. Thank you for asking. The beaches where we like to lay eggs and nest are often the same places that people like to recreate and have fun. Nesting season is only during the summer season when thousands of humans like to come to the beach to play and relax, so you can help. It is very important that people know that we exist and act in ways that protect us and our habitat. Scientists will put fences around areas that are being used by the plovers for nesting. You can do things like read signs and follow the rules listed on them. That's a great idea, Poppy. I'll have to look out for those this summer. Can you go ahead and tell me a few things that we can do every day to protect the western snowy plover? It is best to give us lots of space because we might think you are something that can hurt us and run away from our areas. Pick up your trash so it does not attract animals that could potentially eat us. Keep your dogs on leash so they don't scare us and make sure to fly your kites in areas where it is allowed because they often trick us into thinking they are large birds that could hurt us. Keep driftwood and kelp in place because those are my favorite places to hide and nest. Well, Poppy, thank you so much for all of your help today. I feel like I learned a lot about what the western snowy plover looks like, where they live, how they behave and act, and what it means to be a threatened species. So I encourage you, next time you're visiting the beach, please remember you're visiting the home of the western snowy plover. I encourage you to continue doing your part to protect this amazing species. Thank you, and I'll see you next time. For the western snowy plover to thrive again in its Pacific coast habitat, the beaches have to be a safe place for them to make nests and lay their eggs. But for their eggs to be safe, they have to be camouflaged. What does camouflaged mean? That's a tricky word. When an animal's color, texture, or shape matches its background or surroundings, it's considered camouflage. Camouflage actually helps animals and species hide. This is helpful for a predator because a predator will try to hide and sneak up on its prey so that it can catch it. But the prey on the other hand will hide and try to remain camouflaged just so it will survive. Now some animals rely on trickery. Uh, they may change colors or have their appearance um, make them look like something that they're not. To understand this we're going to watch a short video that teaches us a little bit about how animals 
camouflage themselves. Both predatory and prey animals disguise themselves with the help of colors, patterns, by imitating objects, or even other animals. Now in, how do animals disguise themselves? How do animals disguise themselves in order not to be detected by prey or predators? Camouflage colors. Many animals match their background to avoid being discovered by predators. For example, the snowshoe hare matches with the snow. Or the green frog, the green moss. The doe is just as gray-brown as its surroundings. And the crab spider is as white as the flower on which it's sitting. Me, I matched my fur color with the cardboard box. Camouflage patterns. Some animals use dots, stripes, or patterns as a camouflage. This way, it's much more difficult to recognize their outlines. For example, the leopard and the owl. Sea turtles also have confusing patterns on their head and legs. How does this work for the zebra? In a herd of zebras, individual animals are difficult to recognize. Yet, the stripes do not primarily serve as camouflage. Scientists have found out that they help to keep away mosquitoes, make it easier to handle the tropical heat, and enable the animals to identify each other. You are imitating my spots. I don't. You do. Imitation of objects. Some animals imitate objects. A twig, for example. You won't notice that there's a leaf tail gecko until it starts moving. The leafy sea dragon imitates seaweed. By the way, the word mimesis is a Greek word meaning imitation. The octopus can match the color of rocks and corals within seconds. It changes its color from a bright red to an unflashy gray-brown. These animals are true magicians. Now guess what? I'm a gummy bear. Imitation of other animals. Some animals imitate other dangerous, poisonous, or inedible species. For example, hoverflies mimic the look of wasps. This mimic octopus seems to consist of several dangerous water snakes. If an animal imitates another one, this is also called mimicry. This crocodile fish, for instance, looks like a dangerous crocodile, but it's absolutely harmless. The Animal Fun Facts Roundup how do animals disguise themselves? They use colors and patterns, imitate objects, or other animals. Now it's time for your first design challenge. In your camouflage steam kit, you'll find a coloring sheet of the Western Snowy Plover, along with their nest and eggs. Your task will be to try to color in the habitat so that the snowy plover and the nest and eggs remain camouflaged and safe. When you're finished coloring the habitat, go ahead and share your design with a friend and explain to your friend why you made the choices you made that help that nest, the eggs, and the birds stay camouflaged. Now it's time for your second design challenge. In your camouflage steam kit, you'll need to locate the magic model clay the background paper, and markers. You are going to design your very own creature, and it'll be important that your creature blend into that background paper and remain hidden or camouflaged. Have fun exploring, but be sure to remember the principles you learned about camouflage. Congratulations, design engineers, on completing your challenges. I hope you enjoyed discovering the wonderful world of color through, believe it or not, color illusion and camouflage. Let me leave you with one more fact. Scientists believe that humans can see up to 10 million colors. 10 million colors, can you believe that? All those colors affect how we see the world around us and how we perceive our surroundings. As we bring this lesson to a close, Let's make an agreement to stay curious and connected to our environment so we can work together to make this a safe place for all creatures. Until next time, my name's Amy Drake for STEAM Explore and Design Thinking.
Thank you.